I'd like to start off by referring back to something I saw a couple of years ago, and it was this idea that if everyone in the world were to try to live like we live in the United States, it would take seven planets worth of resources in order to do that. And that really kind of really struck me when I heard that, because it's obviously that's something that's absolutely not possible. And when you start to think about that, you start to think about our exponential population growth and our completely unsustainable use of natural resources, what the impact that is having on the world. And then when you start to think about all the people that are not living in the United States and other parts of the world, particularly the developing parts of the world, where they're looking to us as a model for how they want to live, then it gets really scary. Okay, So we need to be smarter about the way we do things so that we can present a much more sustainable model for the rest of the world. They're not going to want to not have great lifestyles. They, everybody in the world wants to aspire to a great lifestyle. So we really need to be smarter about the way we do things. And it's this, this, this uh, lifestyle that we, we are engaged in right now is having tremendous negative impacts. Things like climate change, habitat destruction, loss of biodiversity, things like that. It's going to get better, don't worry. I'm not gonna, it's not going to be a depressing talk. <laughs> But um, what I do want to talk about is, you know, I work in the Botanic Garden, and in the Botanic Garden, of course, we've been, always, we've been concerned for a long time about things particularly like loss of biodiversity and habitat destruction. And the traditional botanical garden response has been to do things like plant collection, creating seed banks, looking at uh, protecting uh, native habitats from destruction, or maybe collecting the plants and bringing them in to the botanical garden where the plants will be safe, those kinds of things. And, we started doing that. Then I started thinking about, well, are we really addressing the problem here? Are we just putting a Band-Aid on the problem, or are we really getting to the real core of what's going on here? And I think, I think we're just putting Band-Aids, to tell you the truth. Uh, because, and if you start to look at what's the real problem here, I think it's the fact that we are so disconnected from nature. Okay? And <clears throat> so then you start to ask yourself, well, how do we start to get people to care about the environment? And from the Botanic Garden's point of view, we think we have a great opportunity to affect environmental change and advance sustainability, human well-being and environmental awareness by leading by example and emphasizing the important relationships between people and plants. And one of the ways to realize that that's probably one of the easiest ways to do this is with buildings. Okay? And when you start to think about buildings, you start to think about how do we build buildings and what, what, is, what is going on with the built environment. And I started thinking about how hundreds of years ago when we were building buildings, we used to build buildings to not only protect us from the environment, but also to protect us from marauding invaders. So you have buildings like this. Right? Well, nowadays in most parts of the world, we're not really concerned with the invaders, but we're still building buildings that are isolating us from the environment. We're still building buildings where once you're inside, you have absolutely no idea what's going on outside. Is it hot? Is it cold? Is it rainy? Is it windy? Is it humid? completely isolated, and I think that's a real problem. When, where what we really should be doing is building buildings like this, where we're more in tune of what's going on with nature. And you start to think about the fact that we spend, on average, probably about 80% of, of our lives inside buildings, in these kind of buildings where we're so isolated from nature, and that's a real, real problem. And when we start to think about nature then, we start to think about it as it's some place you go to on your vacation. Okay? And the fact of the matter is, Nature is everywhere around us. It's something, it's, it's, it's right outside, it's in the cracks in the sidewalks, and it's all we have to do is really look for it. And the thing that really gets concerning is when we start to think about how are our children connecting with nature. And this is how a lot of children are connecting with nature right now. And this is a really serious problem because there's a growing body of research that shows that the environmental concerns that we have are rooted in our interconnection with other people but also with the natural environment. So it's absolutely critical to get kids, in particular, really experiencing real nature and the real environment. And then, we, so when we start to think about this, and we say, "Okay, well, buildings are a great way to start to talk about some of these things," I think it's also important to recognize that it's not about the buildings. Okay, when you come right down to it, it's about showing the relationships between people and the planet, and plants, the health, uh, and beauty. These are the things that we really need to focus on, and looking for those kinds of relationships. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about FIPS and how we've used our buildings to really transform the way we think and we operate. Now, now FIPS was a, a gift to the city of Pittsburgh from Henry FIPS uh, in 1893. And when it was given to the city, 
people had a very different mindset back then than what we have today, okay? Or at least most of us, or hopefully most of us. Back then, people thought that there was no limits to the amount of pollution that we could produce or the amounts of natural resources that we would use. In fact, people thought we were going to conquer nature. And hopefully, most of us realize that is definitely not true anymore. And of course, this is not the way to deal with it. We have to come up with much better ways and solutions to deal with this issue. But we also recognize that we had a great opportunity to go beyond just doing flower shows and really developing programs for kids and families. And we came up with a three-phase master plan. And we started a, you know, working on the, the Welcome Center first. The first thing we decided to do is replace the old 1960s entrance uh, with something that was more, uh, that would be more compatible with the old existing, the original uh, Victorian glass house. And when we started this, we really didn't know anything about LEED, or LEED was just actually just coming out at that time. We heard about it, we said, you know, this makes sense. We care about the environment, why shouldn't our buildings reflect our values? And, and to be honest, we were very naive, but we decided to go in and start to try and do this. And by the time we finished, we ended up building the first LEED certified visitor center in a public garden. And we started to get very excited about that. I know those of you who have heard me talk before know I talk about the great tile in the cafe, which was sort of a real uh, uh, game changer for us. Uh, during the construction of the cafe, I happened to go down into, their, into this, the work area when they were installing the tiles. And I noticed on the box that one of the workers was taking the tile out of that it said made in Turkey on it. And I was really surprised because in LEED, I thought we said, you know, you're supposed to be using local materials. So I called up one of the people on the project and I said, why are we using tile from Turkey? I thought we we're supposed to use local materials. And he said, well, we already got that point. I said, wait a minute. That's not why we're doing this. You just get the points and then you go on and do whatever you want after that. We're doing this because we think it's the right thing to do. And that, that really was the changing point for us in really saying, you know, like, hey, why stop with the building? Let's look at everything that we're doing. And we really took a comprehensive look at all our programs and activities and everything that we were doing and really started to question why are we doing this the way we've been doing it? You know, we're so, uh, we're so tuned in to just doing the same thing over and over again, the way the people before us were doing things or the way we were taught to do things, that we've lost the ability to question things. And we really need to start questioning why we're doing things the way we're, we've always been doing them. So we started looking at the way we're using pesticides, taking care of our lawn. We ripped the irrigation system out of our front lawn. We started composting all organic matter. We got rid of bottled water. We started to get rid of all the plastic disposables. I mean, we really took a very comprehensive look at everything we were doing and really started making changes. We even started to do things where we went beyond what LEED was requiring for us. With the visitor center, I think LEED required that we had to do 20% renewable energy uh, for the welcome center. And we said, OK, but why stop with 20%? Let's do 100%. And they said, well, why stop with the welcome center? Let's do our whole campus. And I said, well, why stop with the whole campus? Let's do our other building over at Mellon Park as well. So we ended up purchasing enough renewable energy credits to offset all the electricity we use on our entire, both campuses. And it's really interesting, um, I think this was in 2010, um, the Department of Energy listed us as one of the top 15 users of renewable energy in the nonprofit category in the United States, which we were pretty excited about. We didn't realize we were doing that. And we started looking at other things, too. We started to look at, you know, how do we make our production houses be more energy efficient? And, you know, originally we were told you can't get a greenhouse certified, so we didn't go bother going for LEED certification. But after we built it, we said, now why did we do that? We should have gotten it certified. So we went back, and we got it certified platinum under the existing buildings and operations and maintenance program, which was really amazing because not only was this the first greenhouse in the world ever to be certified by LEED, we also got platinum, which is the highest level you could possibly get. And I think it, when it happened, it was only like one of only 25 buildings in the country to achieve LEED platinum, which we thought was pretty neat. Of course, you know our Tropical Forest Conservatory is the most energy efficient conservatory in the world when it opened in 2006, and I believe it still is. And we really had to start, establish a, uh, a reputation as being one of America's uh, greenest gardens. Well, while all this was happening, another very interesting thing happened. We started to think about things differently. Rather than looking at a building as a building, we started to try to look at what, what are the relationships between people in the building, the one building and another building, the building and the environment. And we really started to try to understand how these things function in systems. And we started really getting involved in systems thinking. And as Mark said, you know, there is no such thing as waste. Uh, waste is some resource for some other process. 
So we really start to try to think about these things. And, and just at that time, Jason McLennan launched the Living Building Challenge uh, in Denver in 2006. I was lucky enough to be th at that conference and learned about the challenge. got very excited about it because here, finally, there was a system, there was a process, a, a rating system. It was really <coughs> thinking in systems. It was thinking way beyond the way you traditionally look at things and lead. And we got very excited about that. And we decided to go for it. In fact, our board accepted the Living Building Challenge in January of 2007, which was only two months after it was released. And as we thought about that, you know, the whole part of a Living Building Challenge project, you know, there's that one point about being rooted in place. And we said, wouldn't it be great if we could use this as a building to celebrate the great talent that we have in our region? And then we said, wouldn't it be great if we could build a building that can say that we built one of the greenest buildings in the world and it was designed and built by people in Pittsburgh and Pennsylvania? So we decided we would limit the primary architects and engineers have to be Pittsburgh-based, and any other uh, team that joined or would, would give special preference to Pittsburgh and Pennsylvania-based teams. And we put together a fabulous team, which I really think highlights the great talent that we have in this region. And we're not only going for the Living Building Challenge for our building, we're also going for Four Stars and the Sustainable Sites Initiative, and of course for LEED Platinum. So we're really excited about the potential that this thing has. We started construction in uh, December of 2010, and I'm happy to tell you uh, we're moving in. We've moved in. Uh, we started moving in on December 31st. It was very important for us to be able to start saying we can get in there in 2012. <laughs> uh, uh, but to, today, the moving trucks brought over the last of our boxes, and uh, staff are all set up in there, and we're really excited about it. And I know the staff are really excited about it. And it really, I think, has been a very transformational process, not only for me, but I know for our board, and the rest of our staff as well. And you know, just to talk about some of those things, how it's changed the way we think and the way we operate. You know, As we were going through this process of building green buildings, our board got so excited about this that they decided to change our mission statement to include the words to advance sustainability and in promoting environmental well-being through action and research as part of our mission state. So this is clearly something that's it's part of us right now. This is, so, this is so key and critical to who we are and what we do. And we started to get involved in other things too. You know, I showed you that diagram. We were looking at the relationships between people and plants and health and the environment and beauty. And we started to look at where, where do all these other intersections take place? And we got involved in the First Lady's Let's Move program and started a Let's Move Pittsburgh program where we're really looking at creating healthy lifestyles for children and looking at things like childhood obesity. And we were able to pull in all these different partners to uh, work with this on this project. We started developing programs related to underserved youth related to this as well. And again, looking for opportunities to connect kids with nature. And we started to develop our new outdoor food garden and outdoor kitchen and demonstration areas and use this as a place to get high school students involved in an internship program where they're actually learning how to grow and cook healthy foods. And again, making those connections between people and the natural environment. I would like to say also that one thing that we think is really critical here is for all our programs for kids from, from birth to age eight, we don't include any electronic um, uh, devices of any type whatsoever. We think it's really important to get kids let to get their hands in the dirt. I'm, I'm sorry, I should say soil since uh, I'm a botanist, but uh, um, <laughs> also use dirt. You know, let them get their hands in the dirt, play with the plants, play with the bugs. I mean, really, this is really critical to their development and, the, and for the future, for ha having people who are going to be really interested in the environment when they get older. We start to link our Botany in Action program with all the programs that we do in the conservatory as well. And we got involved in the Fairchild Challenge program, which is all about getting high school and middle school students uh, involved in, in this as well. And so you can see we look for every opportunity we can to connect people to nature because we think that is absolutely one of the most critical things that we could possibly do. And we think by doing this that we could really change the way they interact with the world. We're also very excited with the potential for research. We've partnered with the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon University, the National Energy Technology Lab, and of course with the Green Building Alliance to do actual research in our building. We've offered our building to them as a lab. They've put, they've put sensors all throughout the building. They're going to be studying things like building controls, water quality, um, water reuse, all those kinds of things, uh, which we think is really exciting. And of course, our own um, research will be primarily related to environmental psychology. How do we get people 
to change the way they interact with the world? How do we get people to think differently about the way they're interacting with the world? We want to study that. We want to understand that. And we hired uh, Molly uh, Steinwald as our director of science, education, and research to really look at these things and to look at how the connection between people and plants and look at doing original research on education and psychology research on looking at people's relationship with, uh, with nature in the built environment. Because we really think by combining these two, we really can start to have an impact and change the way people interact with the world by connecting them to the important role that plants play in our lives. And some of the things that we're interested in doing is continuing to really try to promote this idea of healthy lifestyles and to really do things like uh, nutrition counseling and exercise programs and, and things like meditation and yoga. Really try to things to really create this, make this be a place where people can really explore to their own desire healthier lifestyles for themselves. And looking at bringing this, this whole idea to, to the people who visit the conservatory as well. And again, using this as an opportunity to help make those important connections with people. Because again, it's all about these connections and the relationships and looking at the natural cycles and making all these connections between people, plants, health, the planet, and beauty. So, you know, I think it's also really important to you know, I know there's a lot of educators. How many educators are in the audience tonight? Oh, good. Great. And I know if I were to say to you, and I hope everybody else would say this too, what do you value? What's well, children, right? And trying to create a better place for children and really try to create the, the best possible way to help people, uh, educate your children for the future. And, you know, one, an interesting thing, you know, a lot of times when I talk about our project to people, invariably somebody will will say to me, um, so how much did it cost? Or they will may say something like this, um, you know, what's the payback period on all that en and energy stuff and the water stuff and things like that? And, you know, for the longest time, I really had a kind of a hard time answering that question because our society is not set up to really answer that question truthfully, okay? Because a lot of times when you talk about energy, you know, we don't account for all the true costs of the way we use energy right now. We don't account for all the account for all the environmental damage that's used, that's, that's uh, impact. I mean, a lot of the environmental damage that's caused by when we're extracting fossil fuels from the environment, or once we burn those fuels, what's the impact on people's health and, and, the, and the pollution that's produced afterwards? None of that's factored into the equation when you start to look at what's the cost between renewable energy and fossil fuel energy and things like that. So that's, that's one of the problems. But the other thing I think is a big problem is that we've got our values all screwed up. Okay, And I think it's really important for us to ask ourselves, what do we really value? And if you really value something, why aren't you doing it? Okay, And it's really interesting to me to, to you, know, you know, talk about this whole idea about a building and to talk about, um, you know, what's the payback. And I'll, you know, I bet you if I were to walk out here tonight and walk over into Oakland, I probably could find a half dozen buildings that are relatively new. And if I look at those buildings, I probably find that there's some pretty fancy buildings being built around here. And if I went in and looked at some of the features that are on there, these really fancy atriums and really fancy offices and all things like that. And if I asked the, the owner of that building, I said, uh, how energy efficient is your building? They probably said to me, well, you know, we looked at it and it wasn't cost effective. And then I'm looking around at the rest of this building. I'm like, if all you were interested in building was a cost effective building, why aren't you like in one of these Soviet era, you know, concrete, <laughs> simple boxes, right? Okay. So obviously, you value something else rather than energy efficiency. They're valuing these really fancy architectural features, which are wonderful, but I think the priorities are screwed up. So I think we need to start thinking about our values differently and really start saying to ourselves, if this is important to us, this is what we should be on. The, this should be on the priority list of things that we want to do, and particularly when we're talking about kids. You know, we really need to start thinking about what are the values that we're showing them. Are we really living our values? Are we really leading by example, which is something that I think is really important. <laughs> so as educators, when you start thinking about how are we nurturing, you know, we're, we're involved in nurturing kids, we're providing the skills, the life skills that are going to take these, these kids when they become adults to be able to succeed in the future. You know, what are we, what are we doing with them? Our, one thing I hope we would be doing is talking to them about the importance of relationships. Not only relationships with others, but also relationships with the world and the other species. And to really understand life cycles and, and the interconnectedness of everything that's on the planet. 
This is, I think, one of the most important things that we could uh, teach our children. And you know those, uh, those cycle things, you know, you saw in 10th grade biology, you know? Uh, these are real, and we're connected to these things. These are not something that's just, that's something else that affects everything else on the planet. We are intimately involved in all the natural cycles on the planet. We really need to start recognizing those. And to think about when we do things, how are we connecting? What, what kind of relationships are we um, showing with the rest of the species and the rest of the world? And I think it's also really important for us to think about how are we inspiring children, and are we modeling some of the best practices? You know, about a month ago, we had um, a group of students from a university in western Michigan come out here, and they wanted to do some filming, because uh, what they wanted to do was to go back to their school and convince their administration to build a living building. So they interviewed me and some of our staff and some of the other people working on our project. <laughs> they interviewed them um, about, you know, all these things about, the, you know, doing a living building. And when they, when they were finished, they came up to me and they said, so um, one final question. So what do you think we need to say to the administration about living buildings? And I said, well, you know, to me, and of course this is my, my, my personal view, when I look at universities, I look at them as places that are supposed to inspire us to go beyond what anything anybody's ever done before. They're supposed to inspire us to do, not only do the best, but to do better. We were creating future leaders. And if that's the kind of environment, and that's the kind of message we want to send to people, that we want to send to our students, shouldn't we be in, uh, demonstrating the best practices that we, pot we know at this point in time? I think it's really important to do that if we really want to inspire our kids to, to do something really important in the future. And I think this goes all the way back to, to the grade schools as well. We need to really connect kids with nature. We need to inspire them. And we need to model best practices, I think, which is really important. And that's why I think the Living Building Challenge is such a great program to go through and look at all the things and really try to understand why is it set up this way, why is it asking these questions, what are these relationships, what are these cycles, what are these things that it's asking us to think about. This is really critical. And the Living Building Challenge does this beautifully. And I think, you know, the other nice thing about the Living Building Challenge is not only does it allow us to live our own values now, but it gives us the opportunity to inspire others, and it gets us the opportunity to inspire the future generations that are going to take our place. And that's something I think is really important, too, because the world needs it, and we can change the world, and we can inspire the leaders, the next leaders, that, that can make important changes in the world, and talk to them about the life cycles and the relationships, and to talk about the beauty of discovering, discovering the beauty of humanity, living in harmony with nature. And that's, I think, one of the most important things. And clearly, the Living Building Challenge, uh, it really is a transformational process. And I encourage you all to really look into it and to really consider it, because you'll never be the same again, believe me. <laughs>